let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study today. We thank you, Lord, because you brought us together so that our faith will be increased as we consider the Word of God. We know the place and importance of the Word of God in the believer's life. And that is why we come together regularly so that we can look into the Word of God. And so that as we have the Word of God, you'll grant us greater faith, living faith, active faith, so that as we see what you have done in the past for the children of God, we will know that you, the unchanging God, will still do the same thing for us today. Lord, we count it a great privilege to come before you and to come into your word every time like this. We pray, Lord, that our studying together today will be profitable, beneficial for everyone in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that you will teach us great, deep, of forgettable lessons of life. That, Lord, what you teach us today will not just be what we learn in the passing moment, but will be what becomes the working uh, principles in our life, so that we'll be able to continue to apply these principles so that we'll be victorious every time in Jesus' name. We know that the Word of God keeps us strong. It keeps us healthy. It keeps us victorious and successful in the way of the Lord. It is the entrance of this word that brings light. It is this word kept within us that will make us to live the victorious overcoming life, so that we will not sin against you. It is this word that brings faith, because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Father, we pray that you also give us the grace to be obedient unto your word, so that as we study the word, we'll be growing stronger and stronger in the Lord every time in Jesus' name. This great chapter I want to consider today. We're praying, O oh Lord, that your mighty spirit, the counselor and the teacher, will apply these words into our very lives so that fear will flee away. Discouragement will flee away. We'll become strong in the Lord, steadfast in the things of the Lord. Open our eyes, Lord, that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. I welcome every one of you to the study of the Bible tonight. And I'm sure you understand, whenever we say that we study the Bible, it actually means we come together with our Bible and we compare Scripture with Scripture. Not only that, we apply the Scripture to our very lives so that will be strong in the Lord and in the might of the Lord. Today we want to continue with our series in the book of Exodus. It's been a wonderful time we have been having in the book of Exodus. Today we come to an important chapter. Perhaps almost everyone would have heard this story before. Perhaps almost everyone would have read the story before. It is the story of the miracle of the dividing of the Red Sea. Miracle of dividing the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 14, from verse 1 to verse 31. If I can just refresh your memory, that God looked at the affliction of the children of Israel. And then he told Moses while he was in Midian. And he said, I've seen the affliction of the children of Israel. And I'm come down to deliver them. And then he said, come now, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. Originally, even though Moses saw the great manifestation of God's power in the burning bush, he was afraid. He said, who will see that you will be able to go unto Pharaoh and deliver the message unto him? And God said, I'll be with you. I'll be with your mouth. Then Moses complained. He said, I'm not eloquent. I cannot speak. Even since you have spoken to me, I cannot speak at all. And then the Lord said that, but I will be with you. I will put my word in your mouth. Eventually, he gave him Aaron to go along with him. And then while he was going along the way, after he had said that, Aaron will meet with Moses on the mount of the Lord. You remember that he was, uh, his son was almost killed. Why? Because the sign of the covenant had not been fulfilled. But eventually, after that had been dealt with, he came to the elders of the children of Israel. And he told them how God had appeared unto him. And these children of Israel, they were so happy they worshipped. 
And then he went to Pharaoh eventually and told Pharaoh the message he had got from the Lord. Let my people go that they may serve me. Pharaoh, he said, you know the story, I just refresh your memory. But eventually a series of miracles, wonders began. But before that time, God revealed his name, his majesty unto Moses. And he said seven things that he will do. And the conclusion, the climax of those seven things is that he will lead them out of the land of Egypt and bring them to a land that is flowing with milk and honey. And eventually the miracles began. The plagues began. You remember that God brought those wonderful, mighty things upon the land of Egypt. Can we begin to talk about them? How the Red Sea turned in out the uh, river Nile, rather, how it turned into blood. Not only that, they had no water to drink, they had to be digging a well or a pond so that they will be able to drink water. You remember that it came to the time that the Egyptians even said that this is the very finger of God. Many plagues came upon them. The frogs, the lice, not only that, the hail and the thunder and the storm and the moraine upon the cattle and the boys that came upon the men and the women and the whole land. Many things happened to them. You remember that the locusts also came and wiped out and, and wiped clean all their trees. Eventually the last plague, the tenth plague came upon them. The death of the firstborn in every family. Even in the palace, in Pharaoh's palace. Not only that, in the servants that were even grinding behind the meal. All those things happened unto them. Eventually the children of Israel were pushed out. The children of, Is the children of Egypt said, will be all dead men. And eventually they left. Now, I've just connected you now with where we come to in our study today. Israel eventually left Egypt after God had demonstrated his great power in plaguing those Egyptians with many plagues. The Egyptians recognized that God loved the children of Israel and that he wrought great wonders to deliver them. Israel was redeemed. Israel was delivered. We'll say Israel was saved. How are they saved? By the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed by the blood of the spotless lamb. Israel must have thought that all problems with Egypt had now been over. And here we see the Egyptians again pursuing the children of Israel. We learn a lesson here. You see, when we have been saved, we might think that all conflicts were sin and Satan. All conflicts are over, but no temptations will still come. When you have enjoyed a spectacular miracle, you might think all difficulties are over, but no, you may still come across another mountain. When you have been healed in a very dramatic, miraculous way, you might feel that, well, I praise the Lord, sicknesses will never come again. I have overcome this, but who knows, sickness might still come as a trial of your faith and dependence upon the Lord. When you have overcome an enemy, you might uh, congratulate yourself and say, Thank God, problems, difficulties will never come again. But who knows, peril may rise up again. Let's learn a lesson here. So that after we are put on the armor of the Lord, after we have defeated the enemy, after we have overcome, we have experienced a miracle, we will still be standing fast, standing firm, getting ready because... We do not know Pharaoh may still raise up its head again. But this we learn that the children of Israel still needed God every mile of the way. It is telling us that even after salvation, we still need God. Even after sanctification, we still need God. After being baptized in the Holy Ghost, we still continue to need God. After we have passed our exam, after we have been healed, after we have been delivered, after we have got a job, after we have got married, after we have got children, after we have finished a particular project, after we have got something successfully done, we still need God. Learn that lesson. Learn that lesson. Do you know, there are some people that come to the church, they were looking for healing. After getting that healing, they think all problems are over, all mountains are removed, everything is now well done. I do not need God anymore. They stay in their houses. But do you learn your lesson here? That after such great deliverance, still they needed God. You will need God every mile of the way between here and the brink of eternity. You will need God every step of the way between this mile post of success and testimony. 
and on the and the other side too will still keep on needing god after the great experience of salvation with the initial joy and peace and victory we sometimes may feel that all conflicts are over little do we realize that fear temptations may still come whatever victory therefore we have got in the past we still need god and his strength for the present conflict and future trials the miracle recorded in this chapter which we're going to look at in a moment is one of the most remarkable miracles recorded in the old testament in fact from this point onward whenever the servants of god the prophets of god whenever they will remind the children of israel of the lost power and greatness reference is almost always made to what he wrought for them at the red sea in fact that miracle at the red sea became a standard of measurement of the demonstration of god's power it is telling us this that if god can do this what else can he not do you should think in your life whenever you have any problem any mountain any difficulty any affliction any attack any sickness whenever you have anything that concerns you think about this if god could part and divide the red sea for the children of israel in their millions to cross over what else can you not do it should bring confidence within you that with god all things are possible bring god into your life and into your circumstances what then will happen supernatural displays of power will be expected in your life every day with you and god miracles will be ex will be expected every day miracles will be the commonplace in your life when god is reigning supreme in your life make sure that you are not found anytime without god anytime without faith in god anytime without the word of god in your heart anytime without the power the presence of god in your life with god with you miracles will happen every time now we're going to look at this exodus chapter 14 verses 1 through to 31 and we're going to divide the chapter into three parts point one pursuit by pharaoh and his army pursuit by pharaoh and his army point two israel's fear and moses faith point three israel's miraculous deliverance let's go to point one as we go to point one which is pursued by pharaoh and his army we're going to read from exodus chapter one chapter 14 from verse one exodus chapter 14 from verse one and the lord spake unto moses saying speak unto the children of israel that they turn and encamp before Pahai Hiro, between Migdal and the sea, over against their Sephon. Before it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, and the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, and the Egypt, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Let's stop there for a moment. I want to point something very significant to you. You see, all these things we're learning in the book of Exodus, they teach us very important lessons concerning our redemption, concerning our walk with God concerning victory in the christian life concerning the warfare in the believer's life and concerning the triumph we have over the tempter over the devil you will see that as you look at the whole thing here the sage is said for the children of israel to be able to prove the power of god and this is preserved unto us in fact we are told in the new testament that these things are written for our own learning upon whom the ends of the world are come I need to tell you that the children of Israel was like on a pilgrimage. And when I say on a pilgrimage, it means that they were on their journey from the land of Egypt unto the land of promise, the land of Canaan. And isn't that the same with us, the children of God? Because here is what we learn as children of God in 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 11. Dearly beloved, 
I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Strangers and pilgrims are same from fleshly laws which war against the soul. Here we are told that the Christian is in a warfare. Not only that, it's like we are pilgrims and strangers. Isn't that like the children of Israel? They were strangers in that wilderness. They were only pilgrims. They were going to the place where God had appointed for them. And you see that there were difficulties they met in the way, telling us with you as pilgrims on our way to heaven will meet difficulties in the way. Unfortunately for the children of Israel, there were times they failed. But then their failure is recorded for us so that we do not have to fail, we do not have to be discouraged, we do not have to sink the way they sang in discouragement because we see we now can learn from their mistakes. Now, let us look at this, that the journey of the children of Israel was planned by God. It's a wonderful thing, beautiful thing. When you, as a child of God, can allow the journey of your life, your pilgrimage, to be planned by the Lord. It was the Lord that led them out of the land of Egypt. And then every way, in fact, the way they took, it was the Lord that guided them, that told them, that showed them the way they ought to go. The Lord did not leave them alone to their own volition, to their own free will. He gave them the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. So the pillar of cloud and fire will be going before them every time. So that it was that that will, that will tell them the way they ought to go. Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13 from verse 17. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them. You see that God led them. God led them. We need to be led in our lives. Israel had not gone that journey before. They had not gone from the land of Egypt to Canaan before. And we have not gone this way before. This narrow way, this narrow path that leads to heaven. We have not gone this way before. That is why we need the Lord. We need the direction of the Lord. The leading of the Lord. It says God led them not through the way. Of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. Let us be careful so that a worldly wise man will not come and tell us a shortcut and say, This way that we're taking is too long. Salvation, restitution, and also sanctification, and the Holy Ghost baptism, and all this way that we're taking, it is too long. No, this is the way that leads home. The way of the cross leads home. That's where we be farewell to the way of the world, to walk in it nevermore. Because our Lord says, come, and then he waits for us at the open door. And it is only when we take the way of the cross, the way that he has marked out for us, that we'll be able to get there eventually. Beware that a worldly wise man will not come and tell you, is this not a difficult way? Is this not the way of the crucified? Is this not the way of the cross? Is this not a long journey? Why do you have to go this way? Let us remember, it is the way that the Lord himself has told us to go. Make sure that in your Christian life, you are led by him every step of the way. In the place I'm reading to you, verse 17, it says, For God said, Let's peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. If there was anything God wanted to prevent in the life of the children of Israel, it is this one thing, listen to me. He did not want them to return into Egypt. If there is anything the Lord is wanting to prevent in our lives, if there is anything the Lord wants to make sure will never happen in our lives, is that we never return to Egypt. We never return to the customs. We never return to the tradition or to the superstition or to all the ways of Egypt, of the world. In verse 18, But God led the people. See that again? God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. Now we're reading today in chapter 14 that they came by the Red Sea. It was God that led them by that way. You see, some people would have blamed Moses and would have said, Didn't you know the Red Sea was there? Of course he would, he knew. But then the Lord led them that way. And then it says the children of Israel went up and earth out of the land of Egypt. Well, it is a wonderful thing. Do you know something? These people who did not choose a pilgrimage committee to map out the way and to show them the way they will go. 
You see, the church is destroyed many times by the appearances of many committees. You see, in the Orthodox churches, this is what has destroyed them. You have the parochial committee, you have this other committee, you have the pilgrimage committee, you have this committee and that committee. And many times, those committees just take over from the Holy Ghost. And they take over from the Spirit of the Lord. They take over from the leadership, the real leadership in the church. But to see here, there was no pilgrimage committee that will show us the shortcut and the better way and the easier way. But you see, it was the Lord himself that led the people. It's wonderful to be led by the Lord. But then I need to tell you this. Although the Lord led them, you can see here, they met with difficulty. They met with difficulty. Before I go into that, let me remind you that in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, we're told, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. We're told also in Psalm 37 verse 23, The steps of a good man, not of a wicked man, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. If you are saved, if you are born again, if you are a child of God, God wants to take over your life. He doesn't want your mother, your father, your, your brothers, your sisters, or any other person running your life. If they run your life, they are going to ruin your life. It says the steps of a good man, of a child of God, redeemed by the grace of God. The steps of a good man are ordered, directed by the Lord, and it lighted in his way. We have confidence that God will always sustain and protect us. While we are walking in the way that he has marked out for us, should any problem arise. But then let me assure you of this. Although the Lord was directing the children of Israel, and he was the one guiding them and leading them, showing them the way they should go, eventually difficulty even came on that land. You see, on that, on that uh, way that he led them. You see, this is something that many people have not learned. If God has directed them in marriage, then if difficulty arises, they will say, but I thought God directed me. If God led me in this marriage, why should there be any difficulty? They have not learned the lesson yet. They do not know that even though God was leading the children of Israel, yet Pharaoh posed a difficulty, a challenge. But it was a challenge to their faith. A challenge to test them whether they were trusting in the Lord or not. Other people, if they were called into the service of the Lord, Maybe you are in full-time service unto the Lord. Then there may be difficulty. It may be that you don't have enough money. It may be that you don't have enough to be able to do everything you want to do. Because of that challenge and that difficulty, they will say, but I thought the Lord spoke to me. I thought he led me into this kind of ministry to serve the Lord full-time. Other people are called to serve the Lord as missionaries. And then they, know, they will say, I can take you to the place where God spoke to me. He led me step by step. Every step of the way. In fact, he used a lot of things to convince me. But I'm wondering now, because I'm confused, because there's difficulty now. Oh yes, the Lord may be leading you. And yet, in the leading of the Lord, you may, you may be confronted with Pharaoh and his army. It may be that there are difficulties. You know why? Because that's your decision of a challenge. It attests to your faith. It attests to your commitment. It attests to your faithfulness. It attests to your loyalty unto the Lord. It attests to know that whatever it is coming, whatever the storm, whatever the waves, you are still going to be following after the Lord. It may be that the Lord has led in another way. And in that way that it leads to according to the word of God, which will always be, always be the way of holiness because the Lord will never lead you contrary to holiness. Contrary to righteousness, contrary to purity of life, and as the Lord is leading you, it may be that difficulties arise. Yet, you understand, in this case, we are reading out God led them, and yet the difficulties arose. It may be you are led to this church, to worship in this church, and you used to testify about it, how God led you. And maybe you said, nobody invited you. God spoke to you. God directed you. God convinced you. It was so definite upon your heart. In fact, you, you were so definite. You said, oh Lord, I will never, never doubt this because I know you led me to this church. And now you are surprised that even though you are led into this church to learn, to worship, and then to serve, 
and to remain with the people of God till you see the Lord face to face. Yet difficulties may arise along the way. Does that mean God did not lead you? Oh no, the difficulty is just a challenge to your faith, to your commitment, steadfastness, and a challenge to see whether you'll trust in the Lord. Our encountering trial, problem in the way does not always show that we're out of God's way. As with Israel here in the place we have read, Satan and his army may fight against the people of God even while journeying or encamping as directed by God. At such times, we can stand on the promises of God and we can pray in faith. But then, let's see, what was in the mind of Pharaoh and his army? Let us see in Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15, verse 9. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My loss shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Can you see the, uh, the evil imagination, intent, desires, decision of Pharaoh and his army? He wanted to destroy the people of God. In fact, we are told in verse 3 that Pharaoh thought that they were entangled in the land, that the wilderness had shot them in. Because of this, he made up his mind that he was going to destroy them. Let's read now from Exodus chapter 14, verse 5. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his of the servants was turned against the people. And he said, Why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from serving us after the children of Israel had left. They regretted and they said, Why? Did we leave the cheap labor to just go like that? Why did we leave those people and release them from bondage? And then in verse 6, And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt. You see that? All the chariots of Egypt. And it says captains over every one of them. This was a move. He wanted, he wanted to destroy the children of Israel, but eventually he destroyed himself. And all the chariots of Egypt perished. It, weak, it weakened their army. That even after this, if another nation will fight against them, they will not be able to fight because Egypt had sent all their chariots against the children of Israel, and they perished in the Red Sea. You see every weapon. That is, that is passion against the people of God. Those weapons are going to be lost. They are going to be dashed in pieces. They are going to be broken. Because the Lord is protecting his own people. In verse 8. And the Lord had in the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them encamping by the sea beside Pahahiro before Baal Seven. Now it may be that while they were there and they were encamping, rejoicing, recounting their blessings, how the Lord has done this for them, giving their testimony, looking at one another, sharing in their families and then the Egyptian army came. You know, the, the devil sometimes does that to stop your joy, to remove your testimony, and to discourage you while you are rejoicing, while you are counting your blessings, while you are saying, look at what God has done for me, while you are renewing your consecration, saying, I will never leave this Lord, immediately all of a sudden, trouble will come almost out of nowhere. The trouble you thought had passed completely. The Egyptians, you thought, have finished with them. I'll never see them. I've suffered enough. God had delivered me. The Egyptians surfaced again. Doesn't it happen like that sometimes? While you are testifying that God saved you from sin, and at a particular besetting sin, God delivered you. All of a sudden, that same thing will come back again in strong temptation. Sometimes while you are giving testimony, 
how the Lord has healed you of a particular disease, all of a sudden, the very symptom of that disease will come up again. Sometimes it's why you are rejoicing, counting your blessing, and telling how the Lord delivered you from a particular attack and affliction. Sometimes the very symptom of that attack will surface again. Now the devil is just challenging you and you need to know how to be able to hold the force, how to be able to stand firm upon the confidence of your faith. Well, Pharaoh thought that Israel, the Israelites had been hemmed in, hedged in, shot in, and then he wanted to destroy them. The reasoning that made him to pursue the children of Israel is that there is no way of escape for them now. He and his army had forgotten the template, which was the land of Egypt. It's unfortunate this is how man reason. Man, some forget divine chastisement. As women, some forget their labor pains. Pharaoh and his army and the Egyptians pursued Israel to their own destruction. And those who pursue God's people today or at any other time with the intention of hurting or destroying them, they should remember that they are touching the apple of God's eye, and they do that to their own destruction and damnation. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. It happens in this way with many sinners today. After suffering on account of their sins, their hearts hardened. If they do not have thorough repentance and faith in Christ that brings a change of heart, hardened hearts will lead those that have those hardened hearts into much chastisement and judgment before the Lord. But it may even do more like Pharaoh, calling the army and other people to perish with him. It may call and influence others into destruction and damnation too. Terrible as Egypt's chastisement had been, there was one part of Egypt's strength that seemed to have been preserved, that is their army. Now Pharaoh drew all that army into direct confrontation against God's the God of Israel. The army was summoned in haste, and Pharaoh and his nobles mounted their chariots. They were anxious to bring Israel back into bondage as speedily as possible. How foolish of Pharaoh and the Egyptians to think that they could overthrow, overcome the children of Israel was God had so mightily demonstrated his power in the land of Egypt. Well, but that's what they did. They ran after the children of Israel. What was Israel's reaction? What was Moses' reaction? That would lead us now to point number two, which is Israel's fear and Moses' faith. I want you to look at that title very well, Israel's fear and Moses' faith. One is fear, the other is faith. The majority had fear, and one person had faith. I want to tell you the power of faith. I want to tell you the victory that faith can give us. Even though we are told that all the children of Israel, they were on the one side, on the side of fear. Yet the faith of a single man reversed the whole situation. And this is a wonderful thing. Even though it might be that in your own family there might be multitudes of people that are always afraid and the perennial is a continual thing with them always afraid always afraid the suspect devil will come this way the suspect days will happen to them the suspect days one will die they are always afraid if you can have faith in that family the faith of one person in that family can turn everything around sometimes in the congregation it may be that many people in the congregation, because of what might have happened, or because of what may be happening, or because of some of the news they are hearing, it might be that many people are afraid. How will this be? How will this be? How will that be? If one person of faith can rise up there, one person with mountain moving faith, one person with dynamic faith, one person with living faith, one person with a kind of faith in God, that will not take a no for an answer. One person of faith and courage. You see that individual with that faith can turn the whole situation around. The point is this. When you see that the majority of people around you are fearing, the point is that you shouldn't join them. Don't increase the congregation of fearful people 
but you stand aside and you stand apart and, and tell yourself that although the rest of the people are afraid, I'm going to believe in God and my faith alone can change the situation and turn the situation around. Let's now read the scripture. In Exodus chapter 14, Exodus chapter 14, reading from verse 10, And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. Not just that they came after them, slowly, but they marched after them. And they were so afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, as now taking us away to die in the wilderness. Wherefore, as thou dealt thus with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Can you see here? The children of Israel feared and complained. Their fear was inexcusable. It was a sub trial of their faith. Sadly, they failed the test in the hour of testing. Our children take exams in school, and sometimes the exams are sudden. They will not be told ahead of time. Some of the tests, they are told ahead of time. But some of the tests, they are not told ahead of time. It's not only our children that take tests. We too, every day, we are tested. And you see the tests of life will come. In fact, the children of Israel should not have been surprised at this. If you have read very carefully with me, verses 1 to 4, you would have known that God warned them ahead of time. God told Moses, he said, Pharaoh will come. God warned Moses, he said, the army will come. He said, they will pursue after the people of God. You will be surprised, didn't Jesus tell us that trouble will come he said be of good cheer he said in this world you will have tribulation you'll have trouble why should we be taken by surprise didn't he tell us he told he even told us that in a family that three will be against you he told us he even told us that because of uh, iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold he told us he said even brother will betray brother he told us he said there will be disappointment if the word of God even says that the devil is going to and fro seeking whom he may devour. And Jesus said that the thief will come to steal and to kill and to destroy. But then he said he came to give life and to give life abundantly. He said so. He said so. We are to be prepared. He said we shouldn't be surprised when we are overtaken by temptation or trial. As if the strange thing has happened unto us. Why then my brother, my sister... Whenever you have opposition, why are you surprised? Whenever you have persecution, why are you surprised? Whenever you have trial, why are you surprised? And whenever you have a sickness, why are you surprised? The Lord has told us that in this world, we are to expect some of these kinds of things. But praise the Lord, we can be overcomer. And we can triumph. Because the Lord is on our side. I was talking about the children of Israel, that they shouldn't have been surprised. But unfortunately, they cried out unto the Lord and they began to complain. And they began to say, why have you brought us out? Is this not what we are telling you in Egypt? Leave us alone. Leave us in bondage. You see, that is how some people murmur. How they complain. When difficulties come. And you know, sometimes if you watch a woman, a woman here who are pregnant, although they would have been warned, before the labor pain starts, they would have been told either by experienced women, either by women coordinators, or other people that have gone through the experience before they will say, it's going to be painful. Therefore, prepare yourself and trust in the Lord. You're not going to gain anything by shouting. You're not going to gain anything by screaming. Therefore, all that you need to do is just to exercise yourself. Walk up and walk down and make sure that you exercise in something. And while you are doing that, you'll be making the way for the baby to come. Unfortunately, when the pain actually begins, they forget all that they have heard, all they have, they have learned, and they begin to talk as if they never met Christ. 
they begin to talk as, ne as if they never tasted the salvation of the Lord. Look at these uh, children of uh, Israel. How they began to cry. How they began to complain. How they began to say things they shouldn't have been saying. But then, how did all this fear come upon them? Very important. Because we need to know how to be able to overcome the fear. Fear came because their eyes were upon the Egyptians. You see, in that verse 10, it says, When they lifted up their eyes, they saw that the Egyptians were marching after them, and they were so afraid. The only cure for fear is for the eye to be fixed upon the Lord. If you are looking on your trial, looking on your difficulty, looking at the uh, things that you have, you are going to be afraid. What do you do then? Fix your mind. Fix your thoughts. Fix your meditation steadfastly upon the Lord. If you are occupied with your circumstances and surroundings, that is fatal to your peace. And Israel prayed unto God. In this, their distress for help and assistance, for protection and preservation, with bold faith and with holy confidence. That would have been commendable, but instead, what did they do? They cried in despair, in fear, and they cried in complaint. In fact, the psalmist tells us uh, very carefully about this situation in Psalm 106, verses 7 and 8. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. What a sad commentary upon the action of the children of Israel. But what a sad commentary also upon our actions many times. You know what I used to do? And uh, this may come as a surprise to you. As sometimes I get to the uh, tape ministry and I get some of the old cases. Although God used me in preaching those messages. But I get them. I listen to them. Not only that, I sometimes in the past I told them to help me compile the testimonies of the great things that God had done. Just cassettes of testimonies to specially prepare them for me. And I listen to them over and over. You know what I do sometimes? Before I go to sleep, after doing quiet time, after doing everything, I just put the cassette there. And then this one says, praise the Lord. And then a prayer was made. And this has been taken away. And while I'm listening to that, it may be that I'm still awake for a few minutes and I listen to some. While the cassette is on, I just sleep in that condition. And then, you know what happens when I sleep? My sleep is sweet and my dreams are sweet. In fact, many times I find myself preaching in a dream. Many times I find myself in those testimonies in the dream. Many times I find myself still praying in the dreams. Do you know why I do that? I try to understand the wonders of the Lord. That's why, that's what keeps us who are ministers. And if I can listen, even though God used me in those situations, and yet I listen to them, I listen to the messages, I listen to the songs, and I listen also to the testimonies. If I do that, how about you? Why don't you listen to those testimonies all over again? The great things, the wonderful things, the marvelous things that God has done. You see, the children of Israel, their faith would have been strong if they continually meditated on the testimonies, on those plagues that came upon the land of Egypt. It says, our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. Terrible thing. They didn't understand. It happened before them. They saw those things. They didn't sufficiently meditate upon them. It says, they remembered not the multitude of thy mercies. You sometimes when I preach, I mention some of those things and say, how does he remember? Oh, because sometimes I listen to them in cases. And because I refresh my mind, I refresh my memory. Because I listen to them, that helps me to remember them. And when difficulties arise, when somebody else comes for prayer, I remember that has been done before. God healed that before. God took care of that problem before. If he did it before, as a result of my prayer, he will do it again. That's how I continue, continually challenge myself and sharpen the edge of the sword and also increase my faith. But in the case of the children of Israel, they did not remember, they did not consider, they did not understand. Therefore, we ought to make sure that in our lives, we do not allow fear to take over. In fact, Isa challenges us. Isa even asked us a question. 
in Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 12 and verse 13. I, referring to the Lord, I, even I, am he that comforted you. Who art thou that shouldest thou that shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die, and of the son of man which shall be made as grass, and forgetteth the Lord, thy maker, that hath stretched forth the heavens, and laid the foundations of the earth, and has feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he were ready to destroy. Who are you fearing every time? As if the oppressor were ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? When God deals with the oppressor, where is his fury? When God uh, makes the Red Sea to swallow up the Egyptians and Pharaoh and his chariots, where will be the fury of the oppressor? But well, the children of Israel were afraid because they did not know how they would trust in God. They were looking at their mountains, looking at their problems, looking at their sick body, looking at their symptoms, considering their poverty, looking at their past book, considering the price of rice and milk and, and foodstuff. Because they were looking at circumstances, they became afraid. Because they were considering the instability, the insecurity all around, they were afraid. Because they were meditating and thinking on the things happening around them, the stories that people are telling, the conversations that people are having. Because of that, they are afraid. Why don't you look away from those things and look at our God? Look at His greatness. Look at His majesty. Look at His promises. Look at the fact that He will never fail. And look at the fact that He's your very God and He's your Father. Why don't you look upon God and have faith in your heart? Well, concern, concerning Moses. Moses, in his own case, he had faith. Not fear, he had faith. And as I said before, it is wonderful for somebody to appear on the scene who will not be afraid like the people, but he will have the faith of God within him. And Jesus said, have faith in God. And the original, have the faith of God. In Exodus chapter 14, Exodus chapter 14, reading from verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians, whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. There is much in those two verses I read to you. I wish we had time. But let me tell you this. Here Moses told the children of Israel. He said, fear ye not. Well, we need to learn something here. The Christian leader must be different from the congregation. In this way, he must be above the congregation in faith, in confidence, in courage, in gift, in grace, in faithfulness and loyalty. It's a pity for the congregation if the leader is not above the congregation. If the leader does not have the grace and the gift, the faith and the courage, the faithfulness and the loyalty, that will be far, far above the level of the gifts and the grace in the congregation. Then, if there is any problem, the people will not know where to go. They will not know the direction to follow. Because both the leader and the people that have been led, they are the same level of faith. Or they are the same level of fear. But in the case of Moses, he was a real leader. He had knowledge above them. Insight above them. Revelation above them. He also had faith and grace and gift above them. And this is what's important. If anyone is wanting to be a leader among the people of God. You see the house fellowship leader, he has to have more courage than the members of the house fellowship. You see, the area leader, he has to have more faith and more grace than the house fellowship leaders. Otherwise, how will he be able to exhort them? And how will he be able to comfort them and counsel them and help them and encourage them? The student leader, of course, has to have more faith, more grace, more ability than the area leaders and the house fellowship leaders. The coordinator, of course, will need to have more faith, more grace, more understanding of the word of God than the people that are under his leadership. Otherwise, when a particular problem arises, and the people are afraid, and then the coordinator himself is afraid, the people are saying, what shall we do? The leader is saying, what shall we do? 
The people are saying we cannot stay. The leader is saying we cannot stay. And there is confusion from the top to the bottom. How will the people be able to stand? But it's a wonderful thing to have a leader like Moses that had what the people under him did not have. If both the leader and the congregation are afraid, both of them faithless, both of them discouraged, both of them confused and prayerless, then the whole church will be paralyzed. What hope will there be for triumph in the trials and temptations of life? But we thank the Lord because Moses had developed himself. And we ought to develop ourselves so that we'll be of help in the time of trouble, in the time of danger. Moses, the servant of God, the leader of Israel, spoke to quieten their hearts and to set them in perfect peace before the Lord. He said, fear not. This, reassure, this is a reassuring word that recalls all through the scriptures. In Genesis chapter 15 verse 1, the Lord told Abraham, fear not. In Joshua chapter 8 verse 1, the Lord was talking to Joshua, even after the defeat, because of uh, what Achan had done. Now that Joshua had made everything right, the Lord now says, fear not. And then in Judges, as God was talking to Gideon, as the angel was talking to Gideon, again it says, fear not. David was talking to Solomon in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, and he says, fear not. But then the prophet of God talking to the people prophetically. In Isaiah chapter 35, fear not. The Lord was talking to his own disciples in chapter 12 of Luke. And verse 32, fear not little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now Paul had been in that shipwreck, in that danger on the sea. And God sent his angel to talk to him. And again the message is, fear not. John, the beloved, had been afraid when he heard that voice of the Lord, like a rush, like, like a mighty ocean. And then the Lord placed his hand upon him and he said, Fear not. You see, it's the message all through Scripture. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, Fear not. Moses had said to the people, Stand still. Faith raises the soul above the difficulty. And straight to God, he leads us. So that that enables us to stand still. You see, when trouble strikes, when there is danger, when there is problem, we gain nothing by our restless and anxious efforts. You know, sometimes when there is difficulty, when there is danger, you'll find the person that says he or she is a Christian crying, what shall we do? I didn't know that this side will become. They run from pillar to post and then they are restless and anxious. They run out of the house, they go to the cousin and they go to the uncle. They don't even know what they're doing. It is like it's a madman, it's like a mad woman. And we'll run to the church building, we'll run back to the house, we'll, we'll forget to even dress well. We'll say, I don't know what I will do. My child is sick, I don't know what I will do. My husband is sick, I don't know what I will do. My wife is having an attack, I don't know what I will do. This is happening, this is happening. They'll be running elder skelter. Why don't you stand still? Why don't you rest your mind? Why don't you relax? Why don't you remember the words of the Lord that says have faith in God? If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Be thou removed and be taken into the sea, and it shall be so. If you will not doubt in your heart, because whatsoever you will ask, whatsoever you will desire, when you pray, believe that you have received and you will have them. Why don't we trust in the Lord? It is faith that makes us trust in God to stand firmly on the promises of the Lord in order to see the salvation of the Lord. Now, let me tell you this. As I've read to you in verse 13, Moses had not even prayed. No, he had not prayed yet. Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you. Today, not tomorrow, today. For the Egyptians, whom ye see, whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. It was only after that time, verse 15, he now went to cry to the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Why, wherefore Christ thou unto me? I want to tell you something. You should always be filled with the Spirit, Walking in the Spirit, 
so that even before you pray, you already be talking the promises of God. Before you pray, you already will be talking to the people of God saying, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. You know, it is wonderful to have a leader in the church that is not a talker to you. That is not empty of the grace of God. That doesn't have sin overcoming his life. That is not a person that is uh, so sinful and so carnal. That when problems come, he cannot counsel immediately. He has to go and confess sin. He has to go and say, God, I'm sorry for this. I'm sorry for that. It's wonderful to have leaders in the church that will be able to stand all the time. And every time he will be able to repeat the word of the Lord, fear not, stand ye still. And see the salvation of the Lord. Not only that, he already prophesied. Didn't you see that? When a person is prophesying, he doesn't have to be shaking and shouting, does says the Lord, does says the Lord. This is prophecy. He says, the Egyptians that you see today, you will see them no more forever. And the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. It's wonderful to have the gifts of God resident in a person. That at the time, that is uh, at the time of danger, at a time of difficulty like this, you will find the gift of God coming out of him because all the time he practices the presence of God. All the time he is with the Lord. All the time the Lord can be using him. Let me tell you another thing. Here Moses comforted the people, exhorted the people, counseled the people, preached unto the people. Fear not, he told the people. And then after that in verse 15, he went to pray. That tells us the, fold, the twofold ministry of a leader, of a man of God. One, he preaches to the people. Two, he prays unto God. One is not sufficient without the other. There is the preaching to the people. There is the declaration of the word of God. There is exhortation. There is teaching. There is instruction. There is encouragement. There is counseling. But not only that, there is intercession. There is praying. There is crying unto the Lord. There is pleading with the Lord. You have to bring the two ministries together before you can have a successful ministry for a Christian leader. One, you pray to the people. Two, you pray unto God. And one is not sufficient without the other. Now, as they talk to God, let's see what the Lord told him. Now, from verse 15. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ unto thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward, but... Lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And, be, and behold, and I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all these hosts, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen, and Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. As Moses prayed, God commanded Israel through him to go forward. You see, when God gives the command to go forward, we shouldn't argue. We should obey the Lord. But there is something wonderful here. Before Moses prayed, he didn't know how God will do it. He knew God will work. He knew God will give the victory. But he didn't know the means that God will use. It was at a time of prayer, in the place of prayer, that God told him the solution was in his hand. You see, many times, the rod will be in your hand. The rod of authority. The rod of power. The word of power. But many times before prayer, you will not know that the solution is in your hand. You will not know that the means that God will use is already in your hand. But you see, faith in, in Moses heart made him to pray. And as he prayed, God told him, already the solution is there. Stretch the rod and the sea will be parted. I pray God will open our eyes in a time of danger, in a time of trouble, that we will know the answer already is there provided by God. Faith is based on the divine promise. And obedience to God's command must spring forth from the faith thus produced. In our trials, in our troubles, we must repent of all complaints and listen to our Lord's command. 
we must repent of our unbelief and unnecessary fear and then come to trust in God who is supreme and mighty above all. Let's always remember the word of the Lord. Fear not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. What was the result? Now let us see as we go to point number three which is Israel's miraculous deliverance. Let's uh, go to Exodus chapter 14 now. Exodus chapter 14 from verse 19. And the, children, and the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them. But it gave light by night to these, that is to the children of Israel, so that the one came not near the other all the night. It was night time. And what God did is that he removed the angel in front that had been leading went to the back of the children of Israel. Not only that, the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire, left the front area and went to the back of the children of Israel. And that cloud, that pillar, was pitched between Israel and the Egyptians. And then we have a wonderful miracle there. It gave light to the children of Israel so that they can see to go forward in obeying the commandment the Lord had given them. And then it was darkness to the Egyptians. So that the Egyptians will not be able to see their way. Not only that, it kept the distance between the Israelites and the Egyptians. So that as the Israelites were moving and going on, marching on, onto deliverance, onto the other side of the shore, the Egyptians could not find their way to run after them. God is a wonderful God. It's a God of wisdom and a God of power. And whenever God works a miracle, he brings his power and wisdom and love everything together to accomplish his great wonders in the midst of his people. Now in verse 21. And Moses stretched out a hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. And made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left and the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea even all of Pharaoh's horses his chariots and his horsemen and it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud, and troubled the host of the Egyptians. It's a terrible thing when the God of heaven begins to fight, an a fight against an individual, a family, an army, or a nation. In verse 25, and took off their chariot wheels, that they drove them heavily, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel. For the Lord fighted for them against the Egyptians. Now with their mouth they confess that God was fighting against them. They knew now that it was not just the Israelites. They had thought that the Israelites were helpless. They were not trained to fight. They didn't have the weapons of war. They thought they would pursue them. They thought that they would overtake them and divide the spoil. They thought they would crush them and slay them with the sword and destroy them. But now the Lord was fighting against them the Egyptians in verse 26 and the Lord said unto Moses stretch out thine hand over the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians upon their chariots and upon their horsemen and Moses stretched forth a hand over the sea and the sea returned to its train when the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Do you remember the words of Moses? That these Egyptians, whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. 
Moses might not have known how God will do it, but he knew God will do it. The Spirit of the Lord put the word in his mouth. And I told you, it was even before he prayed. And yet the Lord confirmed the words of his appointed servants. You should believe the word of the Lord. When the word of the Lord comes forth unto you, you shouldn't depend upon your dream. Don't depend upon the false vision coming from the white garment prophets. Don't depend upon the discussions and conversations of the people. Depend upon the word of the Lord. And there is nothing to fear. These Egyptians and these sicknesses and these calamities and these afflictions and these attacks that you have seen today, you will see them no more forever in Jesus' name. You see, the Lord fought for the children of Israel. It says that uh, the sea returned to cover up the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh so that the sea came back over them and there remained not so much as one of them. Look at it in verse 28. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea. And the waters that were, were a wall unto them on the right hand and on the left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that, that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. The miracle did something for them. It made them to respect Moses more. It made them to believe the word of the Lord coming through Moses. Well, it's wonderful to know that all this happened by faith. We're told in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 29. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. With faith in God and God on our side. There is no uncrossable river. There is no unconquerable sea. There is no unmovable mountain. There is no incurable disease. And there is no insurmountable difficulty. Our God is able abundantly able to deliver those who trust in him. With absolute confidence in the Lord, Israel crossed the Red Sea in orderly fashion and procession. The Red Sea completely destroyed the power of Pharaoh over God's people while it permanently separated God's people from Egypt, from the land of bondage. Look at this. It was this very sea which at first they so much feared that became the means of their total deliverance from the Egyptians. You see, if God be for us, what we greatly feared in the past, our greatest obstacles may become the means of our greatest breakthrough and progress. The deliverance of Israel from the Red Sea illustrates the absolute sufficiency of our God. The believer may sometimes be hedged in and hemmed in. On every side, a Red Sea of trial and trouble may confront him. But let us remember that Israel's God is our God. And if you are born again as you are here today, I'm telling you, Israel's God is your God. It's our Father. It's the one protecting us. Underneath us are the everlasting arms. You will take comfort in the promise of the Lord that says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. He says he will never leave you, he will never forsake you. When you are passing through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. God can protect his people in the greatest difficulties and dangers and make a way of deliverance for them out of the most desperate situations. The Lord is calling upon us to trust him. And I challenge you to come and trust the Lord. Why are you afraid? Don't you know the Lord is leading you? He has brought you thus far. He has brought you to a place like this. He has brought you to a church like this where the word of God is taught without fear, without favor. And where faith is developed as we teach the word of God. What will you fear? Look at all that God has done for us in the past. And look at what God is still able to do today. I challenge you to call upon the Lord. And to know that our God will never fail. He has uh, promised us and he promises will never fail. Don't stay looking at your mountain. Looking at the symptoms. Uh, listening to those uh, dreams and visions. Forget all about those things. The Egyptians that you see today. 
you will see them no more forever in Jesus' name. The Lord will fight your battle for you. Fear ye not, stand still, and you will see the deliverance, the redemption, the protection, the healing, and also the salvation of the Lord. Because the Lord will fight for you and you will hold your peace. Why don't you rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer? Rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. You need to increase your faith. You need to develop your faith. You need to call upon the Lord. You need to understand that all these problems around, they are small, small things. God can make you to overcome. And God will grant you and give you the victory. Why don't you call upon God with faith and with confidence, understanding that these Egyptians, you will see them no more. These mountains, you will see them no more. These sicknesses, you will see them no more. These uh, areas of poverty and lack of progress, you will see them no more. And the defeat, you will see them no more. You live the victorious Christian life. Not only that, it says it will answer your prayer. And every mountain will be removed. Call upon the name of the Lord and repent of the murmuring and the grumbling and the complaining. And do not be afraid, but trust in the Lord. If you trust in the Lord, He will keep you in perfect peace. When your mind is stayed on God, rest in the Lord, trust in the Lord, it will bring it to pass. 